Okay, so uh, welcome all. Thanks for coming. Uh, it's the famous day, af uh, day after the night before. Yeah, there is some scattered painful laughter. Everybody's nursing the liver. Um, thanks for being here. Um, I tried to do a TLDR, try to be a smart ass. I hope it sort of gives you a nerdy gist of what we are going to try to do today, okay? So, into a climate change world, the uncharted waters, why not? Uh, so my name is Igor Nikolic, I'm an associate professor in Delft, University of Delft. I'm also just a huge nerd, like all of us here. Um, I'm an engineer trying to unfuck the world, right? And as, as, I will, as you all know, and I will show you, the world needs desperate unfucking. Uh, I'm a hacker at RevSpace in The Hague. We play with fire, with steel, with electrons, and bytes, and microbes, and light, and all sorts of stuff. I'm a proud member of the Balkon Light Operation Team. Ooh, you've seen all of it. Um, I teach, I study, I tell stories, I organize things. I am a wannabe artist, um, I feel. And I'm a dad, which is also important. So that's kind of where I'm coming from, and I will try Oh yeah, before we go then, there is a manual, this talk. I don't really know what the hell I'm talking about, okay? There is gonna be a lot of science that I know is good. There's a lot of stuff that I'm like, eh, I don't know, I'm trying to think this through. Okay, so this is an attempt to really think about some very annoying, unpleasant, and complicated things and see if we can have a meaningful conversation about where the world is going to. Feel free to ask questions, you know, clarify the discussion, Please keep them for later because otherwise we will, I will touch on basically every part of life and the economy and the planet, so we can't really ever discuss this to the final. Uh, I get carried away, right? The bit rate might go up. I have had my caffeine, so I'm up and running. Uh, and I might fall into jargon, which is my bad. Do wave to slow me down, okay? Please, that helps me to land. Um, probably the most depressing talk of the whole conference, so <laughs> if you want to leave, now is your time. Okay, so without further ado, what are we going to do today? So following things. I'm going to do a bit of science. Uh, the stuff that, and why did I say science? Because this is the stuff that we know to be true. Okay? Means I will not go into all the evidence, I will not go into all the details because then we'll talk for the next three years. But until the end science, this will be stuff that I am convinced is fine. Then the design, which is normative and I believe to be right, and then there is the bit of hope on the end, I hope. Okay, so context and a bit of theory. We need this bit of theory so that we can understand why this is a problem. We are dealing with climate change, with the unsustainability crisis about the world is about to hit is hitting, has hit a fairly nasty point in time. You will see in a minute a bit more detail. It's important to realize that this, so that the scientific name for these things is the wicked problems definition. There is a definition by Rittel. The thing with wicked problems, like climate change, like sustainability, is that there is no one correct problem definition. There never can be one correct. Oh, it's all about the money. It's all about the pandas. Yeah, school pandas. It's all about uh, the economy. It's all about security. No, it's about all of that and none of that. Okay? It's impossible um, to measure or claim success in any wicked problem. When can we say that we have solved the sustainability crisis? Only thing we know is that we are not solving it when we are, you know, finishing civilization. So you can't really know when you're doing it right. The, uh, the solutions cannot only be good or bad. They're, they're never true or false. They're all of that. There is no final perfect state. If you're engineering a bridge, any mechanical engineers here, civil engineers? Yay, yay. Right? You have a finite, clear definition. The bridge stands, the bridge does not stand. It's binary. You can do the math, you find a solution, you optimize it, solve it. What is a good society that's fair? That is not a thing you can measure that way. No templates, right? All of this, we are making this up as a, as a civilization as we go along. We are trying to just, as a species, survive. Uh, and, you know, there's many mul multiple explanations. Why, does, why do we have these CO2 emissions and why are we unable to stop them? Well, it's the capitalists. No, it's the environmentalists. No, it's the damn pandas. It's uh, what? All of it, yeah? Every problem is a symptom. 
because it's all connected. There is no objective solution. There is no simple scientific truth. Only bits of pieces we can prove. And every solution is a one-shot solution, right? So this is interesting. When you design in an engineering closed problem, you can say, OK, aha, uh -huh, design patterns. I've seen this problem before. Right? So I talked to Tremel yesterday. He's like, oh my god, how on earth can you fix this laser interface within half an hour? Oh, but I've played with lasers before. This thing is different, but very similar. I can use the same approach to it, and so I can get very far very quickly. Oh, awesome. When you're dealing with climate change, you have no idea what's going to happen. And as you are fixing it, you're changing the problem. So you're always running behind the facts. So that's a wicked problem. And the final one, we cannot afford to be wrong. Right? A wicked problem at a smaller scale, managing a city or something, you get fired, right? Here you mess up, you go extinct. Eh. 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 Right, so that's not awesome. So you can't afford to be wrong, and yet it's vital. So, okay, that's, that's the wicked problems. The other thing we must understand is the notion of chaos and chaotic systems. So chaos is not a lack of order, right? That's the colloquial word. Oh, it's chaos in this room. No. Chaos is our systems that are iterative, right? So there's, they keep on happening over and over. They depend on their previous state, right? And they have extreme sensitivity to initial conditions, and they have these stable states called attractors. They have structure, right? So the, the red thing there is the Lorentz attractor. That's this what came out of studying weather for the first time. And here is an example of the wolf sheep predation model. So I have that here. This is a simulation, an agent-based model. And I just want to play a little bit with it to show you. So this is a world where there is wolves and sheep. Right? So what do sheep do? They run around, eat grass, make more sheep. What do wolves do? They run around, eat sheep, make more wolves. So I can now go into uh, Lion King, Hakuna Matata, the circles of life, in a model. Okay. So what happens when the circle of life is started in this digital world? No, go. Watch the population there, a little graph. Hey, oh, fuck, what happened? It's awesome if you grass, otherwise it sucks, right? Okay. So, okay, let's reduce the number of sheep. Maybe we have too much sheep, okay? So sheep are no good, set up. Let's do less sheep. What happens then? So red line is the sheep. Oh, 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 oh. so let, oh, uh, it, oh, and it's sheep rolled. <laughs> okay, so I have just slightly changed the number of initial sheep, and now it says, oh, sh sheep have inherited the earth. <laughs> this, the, who made the model has a sense of humor. I can halt this. Okay, so that's, sure. Now let's do this. Let's add grass. So coming from Holland, that's a weird comment, but okay. So now I have changed the world, and I have said there is grass that grows at a certain rate. Sheep run around, eat grass, make more sheep. Wolf run around, eat sheep, make more wolves. And grass keeps on growing because the almighty sun provides energy. Okay, the same numbers. I need to actually, let me just reload all the way back to set up the way it was. You know, set up, and the set up, and then go. So what happens then? So I've made the system more complex, right? Not more complicated. I have added one extra layer of interaction. And what do we have? Wait, I just realized you can only see half of this. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. And now we are in what's called you know, a, a dynamic equilibrium, a stable dynamic equilibrium. So yes, we are dynamic. We are moving, but we are going through. OK, fine. So what happens if I then, let's say, change the regrowth time? So what I've added now, oh, I need to reduce it, wait. So I made the grass grow faster. Is there a difference? Nah. OK. So keep this in mind. Some, something is going on. OK. So this slide. So what I'm doing here is I'm running that same model over time, the three axes is the amount of grass, wolves, and sheep. And I'm plotting the system trajectory. So I'm plotting the state of the system in this 3D space. And I am constantly increasing the amount of energy in the system. I'm ha the regrowth time of grass is going down. right? So the quicker and quicker grass comes back. 
So what happens? You've seen the dynamic equilibrium, right? It's oscillating around the state that we would call normal. Wolf, sheep, grass, it's all fine. But it's oscillating more and more intensely. OK, so whoa, whoa, whoa. OK, it's still kind of functional. It's still kind of there in that area. And then something happens. Right? This is an awesome sheep world. Wolf are dead. There's only sheep. Now, again, that's an awesome thing if you're sheep, but not if you're a wolf. So what happened, right? There is what's called an attractor change. So there is a system state that the system wants to be in when certain history has happened and certain values of parameters have happened. Now, this is literally what we are doing to the planet, right? So we're not making the, the grass grow faster. We are making the temperature of the atmosphere go higher. You don't have to do a lot. You only have to do two or three degrees, but that's enough to tip a chaotic system, because the climate is a chaotic system, to tip it from one state, one attractor, into a different attractor. And why I'm going into this so, in so much detail? Because people say, oh, but what does adding 5% of CO2 mean? Oh, that's just bullshit. That's 5% more. No, that's not 5% more. That is 10 million times worse, because it's a nonlinear chaotic system flipping between attractors. OK? Make sense? So keep this in mind, right? So we are not dealing with linear things. Normal linear thinking just does not work. It's the wrong mental model. This thing, there's these three words are very important when we talk about sustainability, about climate change, is robustness versus resilience versus adaptivity. They're not the same thing. So first, when somebody says, oh, we've built a resilient system, right? When you do IT systems, right? Resilient. Or we made a robust system. To what? Have you made system resilient to absolute power failure for the next three years? No, you made it maybe resilient for half an hour, no power. Or you made it so resilient in this case, I can recover from something. Robust means I can withstand it. A dike, a, 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 tr a huge tree, concrete is robust. I can hold, 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 and then I feel catastrophically when I cannot hold anymore. Resilient, I, I flip-flop it everything, and maybe I can come back where I came from. Adaptive is learning how to have fun with the situation. It's going along and changing who you are because of what's going on. Right? And most companies are either robust or resilient. Very few are adaptive. Societies have trouble with adaptation as well because, well, we've been doing this for the past three centuries. It's great. That's our fourth. Uh, right. Turns out to be a racist or whatever, but hey, we've always done that. And yeah. OK, so keep this in mind as we talk further. So, more science. Uh, state of the world. This guy, Ben C, uh, Climate Ben, I recommend following him if you need your daily dose of depression. Um, basically, this is the TLDR of where the world is. Now, I, for every of these points, I can open several academic journals, find literally hundreds of publications. It'll be a very boring talk. But as far as I know, studying sustainability past 20 years, everything he says here is true. We have scientific evidence for all of this. Oceans are dying. We know that, right? Acidity is going up. Uh, biodiversity is going down. Coral is dying. We are filling it to trash. OK. Forests, meh. We've seen Amazon, meh. Fertile soil, meh. Going to lose a lot of it very soon. Megafauna, all the big beasts, going to be gone soon. Insects have disappeared, are disappearing. There's a, um, this is, this is where I, that's why I stop sleeping at night. German study, they studied for 10 years in Europe. They measured a 70% decline in insects. Maybe you noticed, you drive around in the summer, you never have to clean your windshield anymore. There's just nothing to smash against it. That's pretty awesome. I don't have to clean my car. The moment insects go, humans go. It's that simple. Climate chaos, because of the coupled social, techno-economical thing, is going to happen. Stuff is going extinct. Things are dying faster than ever, right? It's the Anthropocene. We are worse than the freaking meteorite. We are killing things faster than meteorites have done in the past. Plastic is literally in your blood, right? We eat plastics. We breathe it. It's everywhere. It's doing fun things because it's absorbing all sorts of nasty chemicals that are being carried to our brains. It's great. And we don't talk about it because, I don't know, it's much more important which yellow monkey is in power somewhere. Yeah. Now, the problem with these things is, as science works in 
negative proofs, right? You can never prove something is true. You can only prove something is not true. So we know that this is, we can prove that this is going to not not happen. That, that sounds weird, right? But we don't know exactly when. We don't know exactly how, because it's a chaotic system. Again, remember, we are in that wolf sheep thing doing our daily life. It still seems to be pretty normal. We go in little circles. Sometimes we get this weird weather. It's a little bit more rain, but nah, OK. Oh, wait, suddenly hurricanes. Oh, well, it's OK. Oh, wait, now we have this storm we've never had before here. Oh, OK. Oh, wait, now we had two more storms that we've never had before last week. Oh, wait. So we're flip-flopping. It's going crazier and crazier. We're still in what, what a tractor. When are we going to flip into something different? We don't know. You cannot predict in advance. You will know when you're there, but you won't know in advance. And so when, how exactly, how bad is uncertain. And not just uncertain, it's deeply uncertain. That's another technical term when you know that you don't know. You, know. you don't know what's the right model. You don't know which parameters are true. You don't know even which question is true. But you know something's going on. So that's basically where we are. Now, we can't really fix it. Now, and this is the shitty part, OK? Why? Because it's very hard to realize something is going on. We are talking about next 50, next 100 years, maybe next 30 years, we'll start really start, you know, where people start dropping dead because of climate. I mean, that's already happening, but not quite here yet. So, you know, when a member of the US Congress goes into a Congress session, holds a snowball, it says, there is no climate change. Look, it just snowed. Well, there is no world hunger. I just had Burek this morning. Nobody in the world is hungry because I had Burek. So clearly, there is food, right? So I don't see the problem. OK? The main, th main problem, as I see it, we cannot get it organized. Technically, yes. If you want a sustainable world tomorrow, we do have the technology. We have the energy generation capacity. We can do 80 90% of what needs to be done tomorrow, except you can't because of technical delays and mainly because of organizational social issues. Power doesn't want to change, right? I could have shown you lots of graphs about the power distribution in the world of 0.0001% owning 50% of, there, in the UK, you can put half the money in UK in a small bus, right? We're talking 30 people that own half the UK. Globally, they fit maybe in three buses and you have half the world's money, literally, like 50, 150 people. Just think about that, right? It's, what does that mean for the world is going to be different? We need to change. Maybe you cannot be that rich anymore. Or maybe you need to start spending money not on a third yacht, but on actually infrastructure. Of course not. Fuck off. So powers are there. They're not going to change. I mean, would you if you were there? Lots of conflicting interest. Are we going to do the Chinese way? We will do it the European way? We will do it whoever? I don't know. Everybody. And inertia, path dependency. Oh, but let's just change to distributed systems for our energy. Sure, and then neglect 100,000 kilometers of cables dug up into the ground that have cost trillions of dollars and we've been built over the last 100 years. You can't just change it. Right? I could have put nice memes here, but not, one does not just into Mordor change Mordor's infrastructure. You don't just change it. You have to grow into it. These things have time. When I talk to my friends and colleagues from the national grid operator in Holland, oh, we just add a 380 kilovolt line here, and they laugh. Well, first we have seven years of permits before we get the permit to build it. Then I need to find enough people and be able to buy enough copper to actually start building, and then I'm building for three years. So adding a single electrical line takes 10 years, right? And now we have to completely rebuild our infrastructure. Nah, no. We know how to do it, but. So path dependency inertia, we are basically in a path globally into a very ugly place. But we don't see it. You know, weather is awesome. There's beer and mate. We just had chavape. It's great. And that is so hard to fathom, because you know you're fundamentally fucked, and you can't really do anything about it. And you want numbers? This, this is a. Yeah, that takes a few seconds to load. Just look at this. It's just, just temperatures. Right? The last, what, 70 years. No, more, 170 years. Oops. Right? Remember that image I showed you about the wolves and sheep? That looks scarily similar. OK? And we know, yeah? 
historic context. People say, oh, but it has been warm in the past. No. So first, no, that's not true. And second, fine, but we did not have a highly industrialized, globalized human society 70 million years ago. So I don't give a rat's ass if it was warm then. It's not, it's warm now. And the speed, right? You understand derivatives, right? We all nerds here. The derivative is, is almost infinite. So this XKD cartoon, XKD is brilliant, as you all know. He said, OK, I'm going to put this into perspective. So here is the last, I don't know, several million years on a scale. right? It takes 10 minutes to scroll through this image. And basically, if you look at historical temperatures, there, that's about as the hottest it has ever been. OK? And that's what we're doing right now. So it's a complete non-linearity. Right? We all know rising edges on. On, on analog but binary data. So the rising edge is wonderful, right? If you're writing code to, uh, to you know, FPGAs to recognize the rising edge, you have a beautiful rising edge. It's like non-linearity pulse, and that's humanity. Right? 200 years ago, we had nothing to emit. There was no industrial society. We have emitted last five years, or last 10 years, more than we have ever emitted before in throughout human history, just to give you a sense of the exponential curves. And there is no way we're stopping anytime soon. And if you continue doing the math, and as a scientist, that's your job, we are hitting, likely to hit 700 to 900 ppm CO2. I'm not even putting the methane there, because methane really fucks things up over, right? Methane from rotting tund tundras and stuff. So we're going to hit Eocene. You know, Eocene has been around about 50 plus million years ago. This is where the sea was full of like huge snails and stuff, right? And that's the time that there were forests on the South Pole and forests on the North Pole. It was like tropical island everywhere, right? Which is awesome, except that we don't have Northwestern Europe anymore because, meh, you know, civilization under 10 meters of sea, that's pretty awesome. Um, so that's, where's my pointer? So you can see that, right? So there is Northwest Europe, basically 80% of Europe's economy. That's there. Oh, that is about a billion people. That's another half a billion people. Oh, wait, Indonesia, almost a billion people there. No, just a few islands. China, that's basically where most of the Chinese people live. Gone. OK, this is going to take a while. This is not going to happen tomorrow. This might happen in 100, 150 years, maybe, maybe earlier. We don't know. If you read the academic journals, it's basically forget about North Pole. North Pole is gone. Not now, not in five years, maybe 15, 20. Assume there will be zero ice there. Now the 30, South Pole will probably be gone. We don't know, but that's the trajectories look like that's it. It takes CO2 40 years to get into the into high atmosphere. So we are experiencing emissions, impacts of emissions 40 years ago. Just let that sink in, right? So we still have 40 years of bullshit to catch up on us and we keep on increasing the emissions we're having because there's so much money to be made. So yeah, this is the end game. Mm. So buy property in Switzerland. Friend, Tom. Hey. <laughs> yes. Uh, OK. So what does this then mean? OK. Again, I, would go, I could go literally into hundreds of publications to show you all the studies that were done about scenarios and possible impacts. I will not do that. I have just reduced it into quick and short things just to point them out. In all of these things, we have the knowns. We know something is changing. We know the known unknowns. We don't know how bad it's going to change. And there is a whole bunch of unknown unknowns. Right? The famous uh, Rumsfeld saying, we know there are things that will happen that we just can't even imagine yet. And there's a, we need to think about short-term and sudden things, like hurricanes. And there is a systematic slow effects that you don't see suddenly, but happen over decades or centuries. Right? Also keep in mind that geologists have done the math. And once the climate has changed, as we expect it will change, it will take between 1,000 and 10,000 years for it to recover. Right? This is not like, oh, we messed up. You spill on the ground. Oh, I have a mess. I clean up. I'm good. Right? Climate has already been changed forever. As long as human civilization exists, that's how long we will have to live with the bullshit we have caused. Right? That keeps me literally awake at night. So that, 
that's it, right? We're, we're done for in that sense. So what's going to happen? Much more frequent and much more extreme weather. We know that already, right? We're seeing it literally. I mean, I've, we've seen the storms, we've seen the rains, we are seeing the fires because of the droughts. Every year, a new record, a new record, a new record. And just get used to this. There will, not, there will only be records. Somebody said at some point, you have to realize, don't think about increasing temperatures. Think about the coldest year you have ever experienced in your life for the next 50 years has been this summer. Right? It will only get hotter globally. But locally, maybe it gets very cold. We don't know, because weather is not climate. You, right? I don't have to clarify that. You know that? OK. So much more snow or no snow whatsoever, more droughts or extreme storms, extreme rain, flooding, all of that stuff will be daily business. We know that. My house is minus four and a half meters below sea level. Awesome choice. <laughs> I, I need a double face palm <laughs> meme here. OK, so that's, that's, that's weather. Yeah. Ecosystem services, as it's fancily called, just nature. Right? Pollination. We all heard about the bees, right? And then I think Trump has just rolled back laws to protect the bees? Because who, who the fuck cares about bees, right? They're just insects. OK, so bees go, humans come after it. Yeah? Insects are dying off. Arable land loss. Quality of the soil is degrading globally everywhere. All right? Because we have these fertile forests, we cut them down. We do intensive agriculture on them. We exhaust the soil. It gets eroded away. Desert. We move to the next piece of forest until there's no forest. And then, right, so that's going on, which means that the ability to capture carbon is going down. At the same time, the production of methane, stuff rotting away, is going up. Now, methane, a single molecule of methane, has the global warming potential 20,000 20, times that of carbon dioxide. Right? So one molecule of methane is 20,000 molecules of CO2. And now we're waiting, and that's, we're seeing that now, to, for the Siberian tundra to start melting. And when that starts melting, millions of square kilometers will start rotting, and we're going to have expo explosions of methane. And that's your nonlinearity. And because you get into these feedback cycles, it just gets worse and worse and faster and faster and faster. You're not going to stop it. We got to learn how to live with it. And that's, uh, again, the, the point of this whole talk. So ecological, economic, awesome. Increase in equality, instability, food prices, energy prices, anything you can imagine will be more expensive. There is just no way around it. That's how economy works, right? Economy inequality is going to kill us. This is what causes revolutions, right? When you start hanging billionaires from trees at some point. On it, they will be in their New Zealand bunkers locked up. They don't care. Which means that not only you're going to be more, everything's going to be more expensive, but your ability to make money is going to go down. Because all the traditional ways of doing things will not work anymore. You're a farmer, you want to make money raising fruits, forget about it. Maybe suddenly Botswana is awesome for something else, but then you need to be there to be able to do it, but you're here. So how does that work? Logistic chains, just getting the basic stuff. You know, how about we get a permanent storm, like, like Jupiter has a wonderful permanent storm, right? The red spot. There is no reason why we wouldn't, I'm, I don't know, right? Have a nice big permanent storm over the Atlantic. No ship ever can pass. Goodbye supply chains globally. End of story. No more AliExpress, can you imagine? <laughs> like, oh my God, yeah? So you're going to have disrupted supply chains. Stuff is going to be late. You won't be, get, you won't be able to get your raw products, right? Oh, you want to build this nice wind turbine? Oh, awesome. You need neodymium magnets. Oh, only China makes them. Oops. Chinese haven't sailed for months because there's a typhoon that keeps on coming back. Oops. And so forth, and so forth. Right? And we already see the, I mean, Brexit is a wonderful test. Right? <laughs> it is, right? I mean, they're, they're, we should be thankful for the insane guinea pig experiment. Brits will have a huge problem. Just when, if they go hard Brexit, they will literally drown in pig shit and trash, right? They have no, uh, no capacity to process their own trash. They sell it to Sweden and to Holland. Suddenly, you have to wait two weeks to get the processing of the papers for a ship of trash. In the meantime, it's piling up. And then what? The, the animal supply chain is just in time. Animals are moving across the channel all the time. They have to be stopped or controls. They back up the farms. The farm containers for pig shit just get full. They spill over into the waterways. And this happens within a week. 
Four days. They've done the math. <laughs> now imagine not being able to move goods for years. I don't know, maybe it doesn't happen. Maybe it does. Can you deal with it? Financial, right? All the signs are on green for an intense economic crisis again, right? We fixed the banking crisis, except we didn't fix anything, right? We didn't change anything, we just gave them money. Oh, look, you fucked up, here's money. I wish my job worked like that. Oh, you fucked up, awesome, I triple your salary. That's what we did to banks. So they're gonna fuck up again exactly the same way. We're gonna bail them out again because they're too big to fail. Again, so that's, you know, you can see it already, right? Market, markets, the collective AI that markets are, is seeking for stability. We are getting these property boom-bust cycles again. Zos, where is he? Is, does he have property in Australia? No, that's a very bad place to own houses right now because they're about to crash. US the same. Precious metal hoarding, just look at the gold price recently. The Russians have, I don't know, quintupled the amount of reserve gold. Which means, so derivatives, right? All the financial instruments are being speculated on. There is an estimate and nobody can really do the math, between 100 and 100,000 times more money in derivatives than in the real economy. There's incredible amounts of money, bits moving around, but oh no, we can't afford to fix the bridges, there is no money. Yeah, it's being traded with, it's gone. So cash is being removed. Okay, fuck, we need to do something. We can't afford it. Social, okay, I've pointed out Bangladesh, I've pointed out China, I've pointed out Pakistan, all those places. So, okay, think about the Balkans, the, the Europe, the current refugee crisis and what that has caused. Now multiply that by 100 million. And I'm not inventing numbers here. What, what 100,000 refugees have come to Europe? Something like that, that order of magnitude? Now imagine 300 million leaving Bangladesh. I mean, I would leave if my house is under me water. Bangladesh gets flooded and then People move, of course. So what, does, what is that going to do to the social stability, to politics, right? Then, aging population, right? Look at the uh, Western Europe, it's just incredibly old. Thank you, baby boomers, right? When you're afraid, when you're uncertain, and you're full of Alzheimer, what do you do? You vote conservative. It was all, you know, it all used to be greater. It was all super in the past. So you're gonna vote for the religious extremist because you know religion, that's safe. That's tradition, that's, I know that. You're gonna work, you're gonna vote for a nationalist because oh, but they're keeping us safe. You're gonna go for racist shit because no, the brown people, we don't want that because they're weird and strange and they're not humans, right? It's just us. All that kind of crap comes back because people are afraid. And they're afraid, nobody, you know, of course you're afraid, that makes sense. Strongman fetish, right? We lo Trump loves Putin. Everybody loves Trump because, you know, that's how fascism comes in. Because that's the obsession with power, obsession with the strong man. And all the neolib neoliberal bullshit of, oh, we have to do more markets are awesome. Ask the British how it worked out for the train system or anything else, right? Ask Americans how free market is working for their insurance, health insurance. It's great if you're the one selling insurance, okay? Which means no safety nets, not spending on infrastructure because that's, pfft, Infrastructure, why would you do that? That's not making money, nobody's making money on that. Oops. So again, a system, every, everything, every effect you see, every symptom is a cause of another problem which causes another symptom which causes another problem. There is no single cause, single solution, they're all connected. Because there's the money, you can't invest because you can't invest, you can't resist climate change because of that, you can't change infrastructure because of that, you keep on emitting because you're emitting and so on, right? Technological, right? I don't have to talk to you about surveillance and crypto and lack of it, right? We are pretty good at that. So pervasive, fully automated surveillance made compulsory. I can imagine having to provide a retinal scan to get bread. Ask any refugee in any Syrian camp. That's how it works. You show up, you have your bags with you, that's all you have. You provide retinal scans, you get, a, you get your little card, and that's how you get food. You don't want to give retinal scans, you don't eat. Your choice. Now, and when this is standard in Holland, I don't know, maybe. It's completely logical consequence of having to con maintain control. Reduced access to or limitations on or criminalization of information and technology, right? Anybody got arrested for having Kali Linux on their laptop? Now you got a hell of a lot to explain then to the security officer. What if it's actually against the law to circumvent 
something because that's the thing that you have to prove who you are. Oops. And in pockets, further accelerating acceleration of high tech because it's so valuable and, and it will be in so, many, so few hands, it gives you so much advantage, it's going to start accumulating. Right? In many ways, think about, uh, you know the Fallout series game, right? Right? It's the zombies and mutants and super space rockets. That's actually pretty plausible. Energy. Increase in price, we talked about energy, about increased increase storage capacity. Oh, let's build batteries. Where are you buying the batteries? In China? Right. Maybe they won't sell it to you. Maybe they can't sell it to you. There is not enough lithium. Can you mine lithium from the Chilean, uh, from the Andes? Oh, no, you can't because the storms have wiped out all the, all the roads. Eh? Oops. Fuels. And then, well, you know, stability of supply. Can I keep on getting it? Oh, we got renewables. Awesome, but renewables are cyclical. Sure. I can stabilize that, but I need my batteries. Oops. Oh, I can't afford them. Oh, I don't have resources. Maybe I cannot buy the neodymium. For my fire magnets, because something happened, and we are dependent on a few critical metals. Stability of distribution. My grid is down. Oh, we just decentralized. Uh huh. I've, I talk to utility companies, and they say, sure, this is a small local company that runs Rotterdam and the south of Holland. They need 100 billion to fix the grid to be fully decentralized. They say, there is, I don't know where on earth I can buy enough copper to put it to the ground to do this, and every single street has to be opened up. So, I ain't gonna happen. They can use gold. They can use gold. Oh, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> much cheaper at some point. Right? So you cannot just decentralize. Sure, if you're a remote village in Africa that has zero infrastructure, of course you're going to build decentralized. Not in Europe. Right? You're not going to tear up stuff just to be fancy with distributed. You know, you're going to keep on doing what you're doing. Right? And that requires incredible investment in materials, in effort, in political will, which we don't have, because it's far more important that you are this, that you're anti-Muslim, that you're actually pro-investment in infrastructure. And then you get voted in, right? Transport. You know, think about it in the long term, forget about travel. Internationally, nah, maybe you're not allowed to. I mean, it's stupid saying this is Serbia. People could not travel for many, many years. You don't simply not, you don't get a visa, too bad. Have you followed um, what what U.S. is doing to to the people who were hit by the hurricane, right? Most of those people were able to travel from Bahamas to U.S. No problem. Suddenly, ship full of refugees. Nobody has nothing. Everybody who has no visa, GTFO. That's it. You just and now now what? Well, well you stay on your island, but there is literally nothing there. Well, that's too bad. You should have had a visa. <clears throat> So you see it, it's not, I'm not inventing anything. Degradation of local infra, right? US infrastructure, which infrastructure, right? Okay, we're a little bit better here, but if you can't maintain your infrastructure, like roads or your trains, and you're getting more and more frequently hit by storms that disrupt things, you have to spend more and more and more money to maintain, and your costs will rise exponentially just like your damages go. And I'm not even talking about things like that the, all the people who put in the infrastructure, like electricity, are by now in pension. And the utilities literally don't have the people who know how it works. And the peak of stuff failing because of age is directly going together with the age of the people who built it. And there is panic in infrastructure land, I can tell you. Because okay, there's nobody there to fix it, even if he knew how to do it, even if he had the money. Now what? Medicine. On one side, uh, you know, there's a wonderful paper in Nature, a review of the articles. We expect that by now, if you're below 15, 20, you can, you can expect to live to be 120, probably. OK? That's awesome. So the old people will stay old even longer and vote writing bullshit even longer. No offense to old people. There's lots of sane old people, but not en masse, right? <laughs> So there will be awesome things, right? Gene editing is around the corner. We can do that. CRISPR is here. We will be able to fix all these things very, very soon. And once the shit hits the fan, nobody's going to bother about ethical permissions. We'll just do it. But that's only for the 0.001%, not for you and me. Loss of biodiversity means less new drugs, right? Still, we find the most new antibiotic leads from the forest, which we've just been burning for the last months upon months. General availability of drugs, you know, God save you if you have to take critical medication every single day. I had a similar experience myself. My, my, some pills I take that I have to take that I cannot stop taking 
were not available in the country because Brexit was coming. They're hoarding, paying, paying better price, and the market just says, oh, well, sorry, Holland. Pills are sold in UK. Uh, you need them? Yeah, tough cookies. Right? That's a real thing that happens right now. Antibiotic resistance is increasing heavily because of overuse. In bad situations, you're going to get it worse because people won't forget, they won't finish their doses, they won't have enough, and so forth, and so forth, right? So, and science. Are you depressed yet? I am. And the thing is, this is it. This is real. This is happening. We can act as if it's not there. We can say, ah, whatever, it's there. Now, you can either go into panic mode and whatever, or you can say, okay, we are nerds, we are hackers, we have a limitation, we have a problem, what are the good ways to fix it? Right? Challenge accepted. Come on, bring it on. And it's not going to be easy. And it's going to take centuries, literally centuries. So who can think about centuries? I don't know. That's, that's... So we move into design. So what I want to talk about are robust and adaptive strategies, right? I don't want to talk about details. I don't want to talk about, oh, buy cans or buy water filters. That's not, but what are the ways to behave? What are the ways to think? What are the useful things that we as a community of hackers do that can be beneficial for the long-term bullshit we're going to be facing next 300 years or next 3,000 years? So there's a bunch of useless stuff that you shouldn't do, right? So the extreme prepping, the uh, inner woods kind of, I'm just going to go into the forest, yeah, right? Especially in The Hague, right? Where I have about three square meters of green grass in front of my house, and that's the only nature in the nearest 40 square kilometers. So no, you're not going to go anywhere. Plus, the moment you go somewhere with your nice horde of stuff, then people come and take it from you, and that's it. And bullet, bullets do run out, right? Hoarding, all of that, paranoia, panic, that doesn't make any sense. It's not sustainable. You cannot operate a society on paranoia and hoarding. That doesn't work. But you do have to be prepared because you know you are going to be hit by extreme weather. There is no discussions about it. The question is when and how bad, and in which shape. Now, because I live in the Netherlands, I know two things, storms, floods. That's, that's what you get. We don't get earthquakes, that's fine, and they're not coupled to climate change anyway. We don't get droughts, but yeah, okay, but that's if you're if you're living with Groningen and shell shits on your head because, eh. okay, so that, that's a completely different discussion. Anyway, so, okay, so I have to be prepared for a serious storm breaking my windows in my home. That's just a very likely scenario, okay? So can I handle that? So that kind of preparation, yes, that makes perfect sense. Oh, but screw this, I'll just leave. No, you won't, right? You won't. Because first, it's going to take forever to build up. Then, where are you going to go, right? We've seen wars. We've seen refugees. We've seen people emigrating. Hey, I'm an immigrant. Who's going to take you? Because it's shit everywhere. It's not like there's a local war here, but it's all wonderful across the border. No, they have their own bullshit. So it's not going to be any better. Just the bullshit will change, but it's going to be there. They won't have you, right? I mean, something with borders and walls and stuff. Right? And so that's going to happen. But you might have to. Right? After your home has been flooded for three weeks. I know there was a case in Serbia recently where a city was flooded for weeks on end. Oh, we'll stay. Well, after a week, eh, maybe I should just leave because it's not going to go away. Not the next three weeks. So you might have to leave. What does that even mean to prepare for this kind? I mean, it is scary, right? It is. But you got to think about it, because that's a thing. Maybe not for you directly, but certainly for your kids. Right? So the hacker attitude. I think that's a very sustainable thing to do. Right? So that's why I talk about these things here. I don't talk about this to my scientist colleagues, because they're like, what the hell are you talking about? Curious. Right? Dare open things up, because you might have to constantly open things up. Dare to learn new things, because that's sustainability. It's the ability to retain adaptive capacity, all right? If you cannot adapt, you're not sustainable. You need to be critical, right? Don't take things at face value. We all do that, right? Follow the money. Follow the power. Follow the passion. That's where you know, uh-huh, why, why are they telling me this story? Ah, uh -huh, because they're fanatics. Oh, there's money to be made. Uh, maybe act upon it. And creative, right? Improvise and repair and hack and make do with what you have. You make new things. That's what you're going to have to do, or at least that's the stuff you have to teach your kids how to do, because that's what they will be build, doing the rest of their lives. 
and creating value. Right? So notice I'm not talking about very concrete things because I can't. I mean, I have, I I have ideas how this works for me, but that might make no sense to you whatsoever because your context is different, your skills are different, your interests are different. And so what's the balance between being smart, being prepared, not panicking, having fun in life, but not being stupid? Right? But I think creating value, creating new things is a good thing to do no matter what you're doing. And if, no, if nothing bad happens, hey, we made a better world by accident. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah? So use, make, improve open source. I fundamentally believe in everything I've studied about sustainability, open source is the only way to go. When a company has been, you know, when a chip maker has been swallowed on three meters of water, there's no manuals. But if it's open source, there will be somebody will have a copy somewhere. Some nerd will have printed it out on paper and we have it. We can reboot civilization with open source, not with Microsoft. All right? So please keep on doing that. So Tremel, thanks for that driver. Bad boy, don't use closed software. <laughs> I'm messing with you, sorry. OK, you know what I mean. But, but that's the idea, right? I mean, you need to be able to do that because you will not be able to bootstrap otherwise if you have to. Uh, so software, hardware, low tech, that's very important. We need to be able to do open source low tech. There is the open, open farms, oh, this, I should have put the link in. There's an open source project for making farm machinery. Brilliant, right? Teach people how to make plows and tractors because you might have to at some point be able to do that when the big companies either don't allow you to use it or they, they just don't exist anymore. Well, we, are, we are making iron from, from dirt. Is that a smart thing to do? No, it's useless. But it's getting into the mode of, hey, what can I do? What can I do? Because it's, and we're just having lots of fun with it, right? Communicate and educate. Essential. Please bring workshops on insane things to Balkan. Not just on super high tech. Yeah, keep on doing that. Bring in workshops on, on knitting. Why don't we learn how to knit? Bring in workshops on sewing, fixing clothes. That's a hack, right? I mean, something is broken, you fix it. We need to know how to, do, who knows how to use a sewing machine? Right? Okay. Well, that's better than I thought. So awesome. Teach, do a workshop, please, next year, okay? I'm dead serious. We need to know that. So educate. Name things. You see things, maybe because you're smart or obsessed with something, you might recognize something other people don't. Hey, guys, there is something going on. Oh, wow, I never thought about that. Do that. Talk about it. Observe and point out. Teach and train. Yes? Document. Document. Thank you. That needs to be there. Document. Leave a trace. Right? Put it on WikiHow and then run a mirror. Yeah? Organize. Events, sessions, workshops, cooperatives, unions. I don't care. We need organized humans. Can we trust the government to do this stuff for us? No, because bullshit. Maybe if you're lucky, we can pull it off at the national level, government, EU level, maybe. But this is maybe more sustainable. I don't know. And of course, this, right? Why are we not offering first aid training during Balkan? That's, no, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, but just, as a ba just basics. You don't get certified, but just learn basic stuff. I mean, you can use that every day. Just awareness. Oh, OK, I might get, I might get hit by a bad storm. Hmm, what, what does that mean? Just the fact that you thought about it when you're having a coffee and, or having a mate already makes you more prepared than if you never thought about it. Let alone that you have materials to board up your windows, just laying in the shed, or maybe you don't have a shed. Well, OK, what else can I do? Right? So context-dependent disaster preparedness. And ad hoc organizational skills. Right? Are you able, in chaos, to get organized? Right? Can you pull off a stunt at a hacker conference when everybody's running around having too much sensory overload and still stuff happens? Right? These are fun and cool things to do. Trains you to be ad hoc thinking on your feet. Yeah? And all of this is extremely context dependent. So it's very hard to have a specific advice on or specific thoughts on what makes sense. Maybe there are things that make sense for me because I'm much stronger than you. Right? Maybe, you're, maybe you're a petite female. So the solutions that work for me that involve lifting heavy things don't work for you. But you will fit in a smaller space. So maybe in that sense, the skills that you develop fit your context, right? Maybe you have access to your, some resources that I don't have. But think about it. It's a hack, right? So what can you do? Try to find them. Yeah. So now what? 
Well, first, it's too late to be pessimistic. I've heard this about a year ago at the business conference. I never expected somebody to say this. And this personally did me a lot of good. Right? It's too late to be pessimistic. You can say, OK, it's all going to hell at some point in more or less distant future. Let's just throw a big party, and that's it. That doesn't work. But yes, you, yes, you can. Yes, you can try. Because if we, if we do our best as a society, as a humans, it will suck less. You, you will not be able to prevent major climate change, major disruptions. That will happen, period. The question is just how bad. And we can reduce the bad. So go out and have fun. That's important. No nervous prepping. I'm almost done. Thank you. Go out and have fun. Have fun observing and planning. Have fun teaching and learning. Have fun getting organized. Enjoy it, because when you enjoy it, it's fun, it's awesome, people get involved, and we collectively become more resilient, more adaptive. Innovate and create, but keep in mind, right? I was so happy when the badge team that made the SHA badge, you'll see them running the lights, says we do not want to make e-waste, right? How many uh, uh, conference badges are really awesome, and they, oh, that's awesome, and they go into the drawer, and then to the trash, right? Sure, make a badge, but make it so that after the event, it's awesome and useful and ends up being doing something useful. It just means more. it's a yet another design constraint. Makes it more interesting to design. That's great. So do your things, but just think of the big, big picture. You cannot live in constant stress of, oh my god, one day we all die. Of course we all die, right? But can I, what am I doing? How does it fit in the big thing? And go out and vote. We still have democracy. Keep it going. Do go out and vote, especially if you're young, because you will not vote for Reaction is bullshit, you will vote for the future, right? We've seen in the latest European elections swing to the Greens because young people went out and voted. Do that. Be this guy. <laughs> right? Bring it on. We can do this. Thank you. I welcome questions, comments, tomatoes, anything. How many holes should you break? I cannot hear. <laughs> How many laws is ethically to break while changing the world to a better place? There's a lot of stuff that's illegal but morally correct, and there's lots of deeply immoral laws, right? Yes. I always like to remind people that the Holocaust was perfectly legal, right? So think about that. And also, that depends. Maybe you can break more, law, more laws than I can. Because how many laws can you afford to break? I, I don't know. That depends for everybody. It's different. But whether you should do that at some point, probably. The better way is to vote the right way and change the laws. That's less risky. In, some, in most countries, that's less risky, yeah. Yes. Uh, so I actually have this thing. Uh, yeah, hello. Yeah. So my question is kind of political related also. Uh, so you told vote the right way, right? I, I do not understand what you're saying. You said vote the right way. That work? Vote the right way. Yeah. Vote the right. Vote the right way. Yeah. But what would be the right way? Because if we eventually, at the end of the day, uh, what happens is in a democratic system, you get. Uh, always media that is going to be biased for someone and you will not generally not have a neutral media or anything like that so even whether it is a fascist hypernationalist leader who doesn't give a shit about climate and or it's a fascist hypernationalist or authoritarian leader who gives a lot of shit about climate right it's always going to be yeah yeah you're damned if you do you're damned if you don't i don't know yeah, so because I know, for example, back in India, uh, they force implemented plastic bans, right? Whereas I have visited in some countries where I buy two items, like one soft drink and some salad. So each one of them get a big plastic bag from the this thing where I can just carry them from with my hand and just go off. Uh, but does politics really help, or is it more like people awareness, like how we talk more about it and stuff? If anything, it's all of them, right? It's never just one thing. It's do the one, but also do the other. So like Churchill said, right? It's the least bad system we have. 
It's not perfect, and yes, you might have to choose between the two of the lesser evils, right? The lesser of the two evils. I, I, I don't know. I mean, in my context, I have a clear choice. The progressive, forward-looking political parties and the ones that don't do that, and they're, that's fine. If you don't, I, I don't know, but that's at least, it's a thing you should think about, if nothing else. That's really, I guess, what I'm trying to say is that be aware, and yes, you can. There is research that shows if you can get 3.5% of the population, you do have enough mass to actually change society. If you can get a hive mind of 3.5% population. And that's not that much, right? And so look at what Greta Thunberg is doing, right? That's, you know, that's, that's, that's powerful, right? Something is ha happening, people are waking up. Whether it's on time, whether it's enough, we don't know, but it's a hell of a better than nothing. So that's kind of the, uh, sorry, I cannot be more useful or specific than that, but I don't know. Yeah, I told you it's a depressive talk. Nobody asks questions. <laughs> yes, please. There is another. Have you considered uh, climate? I cannot, I, you really need the mic. I cannot hear you. Uh, have you considered climate self healing capabilities? Oh, yeah, totally. Okay. Look, the uh, planet is fine. The planet has been there, done that. It doesn't care. I do not worry at all about the planet. Right? This is not about the planet. This is not about nature. This is only and strictly about humanity surviving. Right? I mean, we had massive die-offs in the planet throughout the history. That's what nature does. It kills everything. Something survives, makes lots of new stuff, kills all of that again, and keeps on doing that. So this is just yet another one of those things. At the global scale, this is irrelevant. Right? If you die off tomorrow, climate will be somewhere at some state. Right? There'll be more trees there. There'll be more deserts there. They, nature doesn't give a shit. Uh, we happen to do, right? Sustainability is not about the freaking pandas. It's about you and your kids and their kids and their kids' kids. It's not about the bees and the... They'll be fine, right? There's bacteria evolving right now that eat plastics. They, hey, free food, awesome. That's what nature does. It adapts to resources, uses them. No, I'm, I'm dead serious. That's what it does, right? Nature doesn't care about waste. Why do we have oil? Because it buried a shitload of stuff. It, it has trash, it buried the trash, and now we brought it up. Oh, that didn't work out. Right, so at, at the, we can't kill nature. We will kill ourselves first, because we are at the tip of the food chain, so we go down first. So this creates opportunities. It creates lots of opportunities, right? If you're cockroach, that's amazing. If you're a rat, it's super duper, because you get to have the whole place for yourself. You know, and to be honest, I really do not worry about humans as a species at all. We'll be fine. We're rats. Current form of globalized society? Oh, yes. That is dead, I can tell you now. It just doesn't know it yet. What will come after it? I have no clue. I don't think anybody does. But the way it's, it's right now, you can forget about that. That's not going to hold. It physically cannot. We are consuming three or four planet worth resources every year, right? We are way above what the planet can handle. That's, that, that knowledge has been around for 50 years. It's nothing new, right? So human individuals, small bands of humans are going to be awesome. In which shape or form, nobody knows. But globalized capitalist society, nah. No? Well, thank you very much for coming and bearing down on this talk. And, and I'm open for conversation and discussions. You'll find me and have a mate or a beer. Thanks. <laughs>